For many of us, we think preventing illness means eating well, exercising, managing our stress, and sleeping well. And while for the most part that is entirely true, there is one thing that often gets very overlooked, and that is environmental toxins. Now, we can all handle a certain level of toxicity inside of our body. That is why we have detox pathways that run through our liver, kidney, lungs, and skin. And it is only when the burden becomes too big and our body can't keep up anymore that we start to see it manifest as illness. Now, this can be due to overexposure to these environmental toxins, or it could be due to poor detoxing, which can be a genetic problem or nutritional deficiencies. The point is environmental toxins can be linked to almost any type of illness. Now, I'm not saying it's entirely environmental toxins, but by reducing our body burden and getting these detox pathways to work better, we can often find that we heal quicker. So today, that is exactly what I want to talk about. I want to identify for you some of the environmental toxins in our food and water and how this relates to our health. So my name is Dr. Robin Lewis. I'm a naturopathic physician practicing here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And today let's talk about environmental toxins. I want to start by talking about how these toxins can affect our health. But before I dive into that, I just want to briefly mention, because I won't be going over this in today's video, that there are ways to test for these environmental toxins. It often involves private lab testing that can be done often through urine testing and things like that to look for chronic exposure, which is very different than the more traditional type of testing where they just look for blood levels which would be a sign of a high acute problem, like a ton coming in at the moment you're getting tested. So I just wanted to give that little PSA that you can actually test for these things. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. So that's all I'll mention about that. And let's dive into how it's affecting our health. So it's probably useful to first start by talking about what I mean by environmental toxins. Very broadly speaking, this is referring to chemicals or heavy metals in our environment. So that can be things like BPA and our plastics, food additive, pesticides, things like lead, mercury, cadmium. So it's just to say that those are what I'm referring to when I mention environmental toxins. And they can all do very different things inside of the body. One way these heavy metals or chemicals can affect our bodies is through our immune system. So this can be why immune related conditions like asthma, autoimmune disease, eczema, allergies, they can all be heavily influenced by the body burden, by too many toxins in our environment. Now they often will do this through their ability to confuse our regulatory system. So the part of our immune system that regulates itself. So this is super relevant when we think about things like autoimmune conditions, because what's essentially happening there is your immune system isn't regulating properly, and now it's attacking the wrong things like your tissues. So for example, rheumatoid arthritis starts attacking the joints. Things like Hashimoto attacks your thyroid gland. Things like type one diabetes attacks your pancreas. So all of these autoimmune conditions have one common underlying theme, and that is a poorly regulated immune system. Many scientists think it's a combination of things, right? Like you have a genetic predisposition to developing these issues, but then something in the environment needs to trigger it. Something needs to set off the autoimmune condition because most of these people do not have this from the day they are born. So there is something that burdens the body to the point where you cannot compensate anymore and now you have an autoimmune condition. So this is one of the working theories, but it certainly makes a lot of sense in the context of a lot of my patients. Now, as I mentioned before, each toxin can have its own unique effect. And some of these toxins will also be particularly toxic 
to your nervous system. So the heavy metal mercury is a very good example of this. In large doses, it is incredibly toxic and it can lead to mild things like headaches and stuff like that, mild memory lapses, or much more severe things like tremors and involuntary movements. And they do believe it's linked to some of these neurological conditions like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Now, it's not the only toxin in our environment that is especially bad for our nervous system, but it is a very good example of something that in large amounts very obviously affects our nervous system. And it's not that big of a leap to think that small amounts over time, especially because heavy metals don't like to be removed very easily from the body, how this cumulative effect could certainly also have a damaging impact on our nervous system. Another interesting thing that a lot of these toxins will do is damage our cardiovascular system. So the heavy metal lead is a very good example of this because it is very well known for its ability to damage our blood vessel wall lining. So the lining of our blood vessel wall, when damaged, can lead to advanced plaque formation. Now this is what we're really concerned about when it comes to things like heart attack and stroke because it's those plaques that will lead to heart attacks and strokes. But the point is the lead will get in there, create a ton of oxidative stress, inflammation. It will affect its ability to produce something called nitric oxide, which helps us open up our blood vessels. So it can be very related to hypertension in addition to those other things. And it really impairs our ability to heal the lining of those blood vessel walls. Now you might be thinking lead exposures are pretty uncommon, but it's actually not true. And I do a lot of these tests and a lot of people will show up positive for lead, even though there have been a lot of good efforts to remove lead from things like our gasoline and ceramics and paints and things like that. But the problem is, there's a lot of old buildings that will still have lead pipes. Or if you're from an older generation that did use a lot of these things, heavy metals don't like leaving the body. There are a surprising amount of lead exposure still in our environment. And that's just one of these toxins, right? So it could be lead plus a bunch of other things leading to the decline of our cardiovascular health. Okay, so let's get into some of the potential exposures in our food. Well, when I think about it, there's a lot of different aspects, but some examples would be the lining of the canned foods that you eat, especially if they're more acidic things like tomatoes. Those can leach things like BPA. If we think about seafood, it's notorious for high levels of mercury. If we think about produce like our fruits and vegetables and beans and legumes and things like that, they're often sprayed with pesticides. When we think about our processed foods, they will often have additives and dyes that have been linked to things like ADHD and different behavioral problems or neurological problems. If we think about the plastic that our food and water is carried in, this will often leach things like BPA and phthalates, which are known endocrine disruptors, meaning they can play around with our hormones. Dairy milk, for example, can be an exposure to growth hormone or some of the different things that go into the cattle as they're being raised for milk. Now, there are a lot of examples of this. So why don't we start by talking about pesticides, which is the most obvious example because we hopefully are eating a lot of produce a lot of good fruits and veg. And what most people don't realize is it's not just a little bit of pesticide, depending on the farming practice. So yes, they will spray some of these chemicals to prevent different pests, like different fungi or rodents or something like that from eating away at the crop. But they're doing this during the growing process as it's absorbing all of these things. And for a lot of these different farming practices, they're also dousing these crops in a ton of pesticides right before harvest to make it easier for harvest. So you're getting a huge amount of pesticides sprayed on that food 
that is going to go into your cereals or something like that right before it's harvest. And this is where some of these pesticides can get really, really high in the food. Glycophosphate, the main ingredient in Monsanto's Roundup, which is sprayed on some of our most commonly eaten foods like soy, corn, and wheat, is another good example of something that we get small exposures to or large exposures to on a daily basis that has actually been linked to quite a few health conditions like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. It's actually considered a probable carcinogen, which means likely could lead to cancer. And we're getting quite a bit of it, especially depending on the foods that we consume on a daily basis. And this is just one of the types of things that we can be exposed to. So one thing that science doesn't really do a very good job of is thinking about things in the broader context. A lot of these things are studied in isolation. So sure, if this one chemical, let's just say glycophosphate, is in our diet, there is a certain amount we can typically deal with and not have health consequences. The problem is, that is just one thing. So we're just talking about an isolated scenario where the only thing I'm eating is glycophosphate on wheat, for example. But what about all these other exposures? And also, what if my detox pathways aren't working very well because of my genetics or because of the nutrients I'm not getting enough of to run these pathways? or I'm very chronically ill for some other reason, so my reserves are low. These are the things that we don't have the ability to really study because they're so broad. Now, it's not exactly the fault of the scientific community, but this is where we really need to use our critical thinking because it's not just one chemical. It's a lot of different chemicals in a lot of different places, and that's a lot of burden on the body. So for those of you who can't realistically afford to eat exclusively organic, there are certain things you can prioritize. So the EWG will always update their Dirty Dozen list, which is basically the top 12 produce that are the most sprayed of this period of time. So things like peaches and apples and strawberries will often show up on these lists. So instead of eating exclusively organic, you could just choose the worst offenders to try and reduce the burden as much as possible if you can't completely go organic for whatever reason. So another exposure, like I've mentioned, is mercury in our seafood. And their heavy metal has a very interesting pattern it will tend to get worse higher up in the food chain when we think about the context of seafood. So we think about things like sharks being the top of the food chain. They would actually have the most mercury in them because they're eating the smaller fish, which are eating the plankton. And at every level, it's accumulating mercury because mercury doesn't really like to leave the body. A lot of these heavy metals have a really hard time getting removed and so they bioaccumulate. So whatever you're eating can bioaccumulate in you too. And as I've mentioned before, these heavy metals can wreak havoc on our health. So seafood is another really good example of a place where you have the best intentions. You're eating wonderful salmon, all of these great things, but you're actually giving yourself a low grade mercury exposure that for the wrong individual can lead to a lot of health consequences. And one more example I wanted to mention because it's one thing that a lot of my patients are eating a lot of with, again, the right intentions, and that is protein powder. So protein powder, especially if you're trying to increase your protein intake, can be consumed in really large volumes. If you're hitting the gym a lot and you don't have enough time to eat a million chicken breasts, for example, you're gonna get a lot of protein powder. And when they studied this, it is a really high exposure of things like heavy metals. So lead, mercury, arsenic, and cadmium have all been found in these protein powders. Now, of course, not all protein powders have this, but when they looked at it, approximately 40% did. So that's actually a high percentage of different powders 
that have some level of heavy metals in them. And interestingly enough, they did find that the plant-based ones were more likely to. So I'm not saying never have a protein powder, never have a vegan shake or anything like that, but be aware of what you're buying. Go to these places where they do go above and beyond to quality control their products. These things are not well regulated and a lot of these companies are not required to test for things like heavy metals. So you want companies that care enough to do it anyways, because this is what we don't have in our regulatory system. And so you want to know where you're buying these protein powders from. Of course, there's many other exposures, but those were just some really interesting ones to think about when you're getting started in cleaning up your food. Now let's talk about water. It's just mind boggling to think about all the different things that can get into our water. So air pollution can get into things like our rivers and our reservoirs, the water that is at the surface, and then our soils as they soak up all these toxins from different industries or sprays, they can leach things into our groundwater. The most common things they found in the water that is being um, used as reservoirs for drinking water are things like different pathogens, industrial waste, metals, naturally occurring substances, pharmaceuticals, agricultural waste, wildfire debris, and biogenic products. And we do filter for a lot of these things, but unfortunately, not all of these things because we have thousands of different chemicals being used on a day-to-day -day basis. And our filtration systems, while yes, have come a long way are not perfect systems. So again, this is where going above and beyond can be extremely helpful. Now you might be thinking, okay, cool. That's in the reservoirs. It's not in the drinking water. They've actually studied drinking water to look for these contaminants. How many make their way through? And they have again found things like pesticides, heavy metals, different solvents, different endocrine disruptors, in your drinking water, even in places like North America, where we would be considered to have fairly good drinking water. And we've done a really good job of preventing things like microbes in our water. So we don't get like diarrhea and different infections from our water, but it's the chemicals that seem to be quite pervasive and can evade a lot of these filtration systems that are designed to make our drinking water better. So yes, I know this is very vague and broad, but this topic is enormous. <laughs> There's so many different things we can go into. So I don't have time, um, and I'm sure you don't have the attention span to listen to me rattle on on every single one, but it's just my way of encouraging you to really critically think about this. Again, especially if you are on this health journey, trying to feel better, trying to optimize your health, one way you can do that is by thinking about what is in your food and water that you don't want it to be. And then how do you remove some of that burden? How do you choose better foods? How do you choose filtration systems that you can put into your own home to get around this issue with some of the drinking water in various different places in the world? So hopefully one of these days I can go into the nuances of different water filters because this is a very interesting topic. There's very good ones out there. There's very crappy ones out there, but this is just the starting point to get you thinking about environmental toxins and how they may affect your health. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, by all means, comment them below. And again, thanks for supporting the channel.